The reason the loop of Henley is so important is because it keeps you alive. And more specifically, it keeps you well hydrated. Hello Dr. Humans, welcome back to the channel and today's video which is all about the loop of Henley. Now why is the loop of Henley relevant to you, your exams and doctor life? The reason the loop of Henley is so important is because it keeps you alive and more specifically it keeps you well hydrated. Without loops of Henley we'd all be dying of dehydration somewhere. Now that said there are animals who do not require a loop of Henley. Apparently frogs fall into this category. But frogs usually live right next to water. And so evolution was like, well, we probably don't need to install a loop of Henley into this frog situation. But for other mammals and humans <laughs> and things that live in the desert, we need a long loop of Henley to keep us well hydrated between drinks. And whilst water conservation is the main function of the loop of Henley, it's not the only one. And in fact, the loop of Henley also helps in the reabsorption of specific electrolytes such as calcium and magnesium. Now for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm not gonna cover calcium and magnesium absorption in great detail. But if you are interested in learning more about this, be sure to check out Tubio School, which is available over on our website. That'll teach you everything you need to know about calcium, magnesium, bartles, gittlemans, all of that in a super fun way. It's like Netflix meets tubular physiology. It's so much fun. But today I wanted to focus in on how the loop of Henley helps us to stay alive in water deprived situations. And the way it does this is so clever. Perhaps the first thing to point out is that there are two different types of nephron, the cortical nephron and the juxtamedullary nephron. The cortical nephrons have shorter loops of Henle than juxtamedullary nephrons. They tend to play more of a role in electrolyte reabsorption, whilst the juxtamedullary nephrons have long loops of Henle that are predominantly designed to help us with water conservation. So in this lesson, we're going to be focusing on the juxtamedullary nephrons, which have those long loops of Henley. And you may remember from your student days that the longer the loop of Henley, the more water you can reabsorb and the more concentrated you can make your urine. And you'll remember that it does this using something known as the counter current mechanism, which we'll circle back to in just a tick. But first, I want to zoom out and show you something that is key to understanding the loop of Henley. And that is the relationship between the loop of Henley and the collecting ducts. The loop of Henley sits right next to the collecting ducts. And these two structures work in harmony to reabsorb water and concentrate the urine. Now, remember the collecting ducts are impermeable to water. Unless, of course, you open the floodgates using aquaporins. Aquaporins are placed in the collecting duct under the influence of vasopressin or ADH. So when we are thirsty, our pituitary gland releases vasopressin, it goes to the kidney and works to insert these aquaporins into the collecting duct. But water will only move through these channels down its concentration gradient. In other words, water will only move through these channels if there's lots of salt on the other side. Water loves the salt. So here we have two things to help us take in water when we need to. We have the aquaporins placed there by vasopressin and we have the concentration gradient which entices water to move across using those aquaporins and come back into the body. And that concentration gradient is created by the loop of Henley. And it does this using its countercurrent mechanism. Let's unpack that now. The loop of Henley's goal in life is to make the interstitium as concentrated as possible. The more salts in that interstitium, the more water we can ultimately absorb. The loop of Henley is a U-shaped bend. They say it's like a hairpin because it's all happening very close together. We have the descending limb and the ascending limb. The descending limb is freely permeable to water and solutes, so it can equilibrate with its surrounds. The ascending limb is not freely permeable to water and it is very selective 
with Solute Transport. And it has a very famous Solute Transporter known as NKCC2, the Sodium Potassium Chloride Co-Transporter. Yes, this is the transporter that is blocked by frusmide. So, if we take the loop of Henle as though it's receiving tubular fluid for the first time ever, the fluid coming in from the proximal tubule is going to be the same concentration as plasma. This fluid enters the descending loop of Henle and equilibrates with its surrounds. Then, it will continue around the bend to the ascending limb. Here, water cannot move and NKCC2 transports those specific salts into the interstitium. Now the interstitium is more concentrated than before and at the same time more tubular fluid is entering the loop of Henle from the proximal tubule. This time the fluid enters the descending limb with the same osmolarity as plasma but now it's going to equilibrate with surrounds that are more concentrated, right? So the tubular fluid becomes more concentrated. This fluid then travels around the bend to the ascending limb where again salts are pumped into the interstitium and water is left behind. And so it goes round and round and round and you can see how this creates an amplification loop as the cycle continues. And the longer the loop of Henle, the bigger the amplification loop. And because this is happening at multiple levels, we have a situation where as the tubular fluid travels down the descending loop of Henle to the bend, it gathers solute as it goes. And so, at the very bottom of the loop of Henle, the solute concentration or osmolarity within the interstitium and tubular fluid is at its absolute maximum say 1200 milliosmoles per kilogram. And this value of maximum osmolarity at the bottom of the loop of Henle is the maximum concentration of that person's urine. Basically, the longer the loop of Henle, the more you can concentrate your urine, but it will max out at this value. And so what that means is that even if you are dehydrated and in the desert with no access to water, you will maximally concentrate your urine to this value. You'll reabsorb as much water as you possibly can using this concentration gradient, but ultimately you'll still lose some water in the urine. So when you are dehydrated, the loop of Henle will buy you some time to find water, but it's not going to alleviate the need to find water. Okay, that said, there's one more piece of magic within this countercurrent mechanism that I want to show you, and this will blow your mind. So here, we're at the bend of the loop of Henle, and we have just seen how we arrive at this maximum solute concentration within the interstitium. And this sits right next to the collecting duct. Now, as the tubular fluid moves back up into the ascending limb, this solute is going to be pumped out into the interstitium, leaving a very watery fluid behind. So, by the time we get to the top of the loop of Henle, this tubular fluid is very watery indeed. And this watery fluid is going to travel into the collecting ducts. Now we've come full circle. Can you see how magical this is? Now, here in the collecting duct, we have a super watery fluid in the tubule together with that super concentrated solute filled interstitium. Now, if we insert an aquaporin into this collecting duct, water will move so eagerly along its concentration gradient, I can't even, and it will be reabsorbed massively back into the body. It's a thing of beauty, it is physiology in motion. But wait a minute, I hear you say. If things like water are being reabsorbed, then there must be blood vessels here too. And wouldn't blood vessels kind of sabotage this whole situation? And I'm so glad you asked. Here in the loop of Henley, the blood vessels by design, also follow a U-shaped configuration. These capillaries are known as the vasa recta, and by following the shape of the loop of Henle, they do not interfere with these concentration gradients. So that was the loop of Henle countercurrent mechanism in a nutshell. I really hope you enjoyed this lesson, and if you are studying Reno for your exams, then be sure to check out all of the resources over on our website, including our free GN Kickstart Challenge. In the 7-day challenge, you'll have access to our signature GN tutorial, which teaches you everything 
you need to know about GN in just 40 minutes. It's like a cheat code for learning GN. You will actually understand GN by the end, maybe for the first time ever, and come away with everything you learned all on one page. And you also have access to the deluxe version of Immunology The War Is Over, which is ad-free and packed with so many goodies like MCQs and handy printables. So if that sounds like something you need in your life, then go ahead, click the link and kickstart those studies in our free seven day challenge. And otherwise, I hope to see you again soon for some more high yield learning.